Well, welcome to the e-filing voluntary stage overview. Uh, this training will provide an overview of e-filing and how to prepare for the voluntary stage. This presentation was developed from the Quick Start Guide, which is already available on the CPSC e-filing webpage. During this presentation, I will first cover the e-filing program roadmap, uh, then discuss the e-filing voluntary stage goal and provide an introduction to the program. Then I will discuss roles and responsibilities of the trade partners to provide some best practices for implementation, and then discuss how you as an importer can participate in the voluntary stage, uh, share with you some e-filing resources and support services. We are currently in phase three of the e-filing program roadmap, which is where we are finalizing our rulemaking and also starting our voluntary stage. Previously, we just completed the beta pilot in June of this year, where we had 37 participants. During that time, we had 111 full message sets filed, 3,670 reference message sets, 480 disclaims, and 5,523 certificates. As once we commence on the voluntary stage, uh, then and up to the point of phase four uh, would be full implementation. And that is when we will roll out the e final e-filing requirements, which will be in or around 2025. Uh, the purpose of the voluntary stage is for is an opportunity for importers and their trade partners to gain access to the CPSC product registry and begin testing the e-filing process. Um, this will begin rather soon and up to an additional 2000 importers will be able to participate. Voluntary participants will be onboarded on a first come first serve rolling basis over the next several months. So CPSC can provide proper support to newly onboarded participants. If you have not done so already, please sign up for the voluntary stage and you'll be added to the wait list. You could do so by emailing efiling support at cpsc.gov with your interest. That email address will be on the last slide of this presentation. If this is new to you, um, e-filing is a CPSC initiative under which importers of regulated consumer products will electronically file data elements from a certificate of compliance with U.S. Customs and Border Protection via a partner government agency message set. E-filing is only changing how importers manage product certificate data, not which products require certificate. That has been a requirement since 2008. A consumer product that is subject to a CPSC rule ban standard of regulation will continue to require a certificate of compliance, which will be e-filed at the time of entry. Furthermore, as the Commission regulates new products, then those products will be subject to e-filing. E-filing alone is not increasing the number of products that require testing and certification. Uh, e-filing is dependent on other regulations that have that regulate consumer products. So for example, the commission recently published regulations for button cell and coin batteries. Now products containing those products would also be subject to e-filing. With this project, we are modernizing the approach for filing certificate data instead of relying on PDF formats and emails. The data certificate data would be stored electronically in the secure CPSC product registry where importers and their trade partners will have multiple options for electronically filing a PJ message set before a shipment arrives. This would also allow for real-time data capture and streamline processes for trade and easier compliance with CPSC certification requirements. There will be two means for filing certificate data, the full and reference message sets. However, during this presentation, I will primarily focus on the reference message set as it would be the preferable method for most importers. In fact, during the beta pilot, the overwhelming majority of certificates were filed via a reference message set. In a reference message set, the importer pre-enters the certificate data into the CPSC product registry, 
which is developed and maintained by CPSC. As you can see in this graphic, the importer prepares their certificate data, and then that data is entered into the CPSC product registry in the center. At the time of entry, the importer provides certificate identifiers to their broker who files those identifiers into the reference message set into CBP ACE. Entry data and certificate identifiers are then sent to CPSC at, to CPSC system. At that point, CPSC is able to pull that certificate from the product registry and use that for risk assessment. This option is preferable if the importer repeatedly imports regulated consumer products covered by the same product certificate. By using the product registry, the importer can leverage manual or bulk upload features to file product certificate data in a streamlined and accelerated manner. The full message set is only recommended if the importer imports a limited number of regulated consumer products or does not repeatedly import the same product. When using the full message set, you do not use the product registry. Instead, the importer provides their broker with all certificate data elements, which the broker files into the CBPA system. At that point, the data is only used once and is not saved. So if there's a repeated shipment of the same product using the same certificate, then the same information. Of participating in e-filing. Um, first and foremost is actually this last one on the right, reduction and risk score. CPSC will use the certificate data to, but to improve its risk score. So CPSC could have a greater focus on higher risk products and help facilitate trade of compliant goods. So an importer providing compliant certificate data should see reduced hold times, fewer exams, fewer holds to check for certificates, and ultimately reduce cost to the importer. Uh, over these next few slides, I'll be solely referencing the reference message set uh, and discussing the certificate identifiers, which are three IDs which are critical for filing a PGA, a reference message set, because CPSC will use those three identifiers to properly identify the importer certificate in the product registry. First, the certifier ID identifies the importer's business account in the product registry. Product ID identifies the product, and then the version ID identifies the specific version of the product. Any incorrect identifier will prevent CPS system from correctly identifying the certificate upon import of your shipment, and your broker will receive an error message upon submission of the message set. I want you to note that CPSC will be using certificate data for risk assessment to better target high-risk shipments, as I mentioned on the previous page. Uh, CPSC does not intend to use certificate data for admissibility decisions, so an error in providing these certificate identifiers would not result in a delay of your shipment, but could result in a higher risk score of your shipment. Over, on this slide, I'll go into more detail about each of these IDs. The certifier ID is a unique identifier created by the importer that is ultimately responsible for certifying the product certificates. This ID is created once the importer creates their business account, and it only needs to be provided once to the broker. It will never change. So this ID ensures that the correct importer is linked to the certificate of compliance that is filed in the product registry. CPSC advises that the importer uses a simple, alphanumeric, easily identified version of their company name that fits within a 23-character limit. You may use spaces and special characters, but we do not advise that, just for the ease of providing this ID to your broker. So, for example, if your company is named ABC Co., we just recommend a certifier ID called ABC Co. The ID in the ID um, cases does not factor in, so it doesn't matter whether all these letters are capitalized or lowercase. The product ID is a unique identifier for the product being certified, and it should just be the current product ID for the product, which could be one of the seven possible ID types, including G10, SKU, UPC, model number, serial number, or register number. 
And if none of those fits, you could provide an alternate ID. So in reality, it's any ID that you would like to provide to uniquely identify the product. For example, if a importer ABC company imports a product with the product SKU of A1234567, then that is their product ID. And lastly is version ID. I will spend a bit more time on this slide because this um, may be the most confusing of all three of IDs. The version ID is a unique identifier for the specific version of a product certificate in the product registry. Uh, this is needed because there are many times when the same product may be covered by multiple certificate versions. CPSC's requirements that the actual certificate that covers the product in question be provided and not the most recent certificate. So, for example, whenever there's annual retesting for a product, uh, typically for children's products, then new testing will be conducted and therefore a new certificate be created. Because recall that the testing, the lab test date is a field on the certificate. Um, in another example, the same product may be manufactured two different locations, and that is considered a material change, and therefore there's two versions of the same certificate. The ver this product ID and version ID must be unique as a pair. Um, and so, and the version ID should be some alphanumeric ID that your team can easily track and sequentially increment as you add and update product certificates in the product registry. In the examples I provided, these are conditions where a new certificate will be created because there'll be a change on in some of the data fields on the certificate. Uh, the quick start guide does provide other examples of when a new version must be created, and I do encourage you to review those carefully. Uh, but to summarize though, CPSC is using a definition of material change when a new certificate is required. So if there's a change in the manufacturing process, are the component parts that go into the product, or if there's any reasonable expectation that requirements for the products may have changed, then there should be new testing done. And whenever there's new testing, there should be a new certificate. Um, so I do encourage you to just continue um, Excuse me, e filing does not affect how often testing should occur. Uh, that requirement still stays the same as it has previously. And so, whenever, but as a rule of thumb, whenever you do new testing for your product, you should have a new certificate. Um, this means that you could be importing products covered by multiple certificates at the same time. That is why we do request that there's a version ID. Because for example, you may have a product manufactured uh, la last year under one batch run. And now in this new year, you created the same product manufactured again, but had it retested for this year. And therefore this is a new batch run of products. Although the product ID stays the same and for the, in the consumer eyes, the product is the same. Uh, in fact, there needs to be two separate certificates, one version covering last year's batch and one version covering this year's batch. So as in this example I, on this slide, uh, you could use V1 for the first version of the certificate and then V2 for the second one. I, but that versioning could be anything that you wish as long as the product ID and version ID combination is unique. and. Um, other recommendations is that you use something that uh, an ID or a, a, an ID number that you already currently use in your own system. So, for example, um, since a certificate needs to be a new certificate needs to be created every time there's testing, you could take the test report ID and use it as your version number to make it easier to uh, maintain integrity and be able to match um, products to their test reports. On these next two slides, I'm just going to give an overview of the current CPSC requirements. These requirements have been around since 2008, and again, e-filing does not change that. E-filing only changes the process certificate information is provided to CPSC. 
Products must be certified if they're subject to consumer product safety rule, ban, similar rule, standard, or regulation. They are, if the product is imported for consumption or warehousing or is distributed into commerce, I do want to note that the minimus shipments are included in e-filing. To minimus is only a tariff exemption, but and not a public health or safety exemption. So any product, even under the threshold of eight hundred dollars, does require a certificate. Ultimately, importers are responsible for certification, but the importers and trade partners should have a clear understanding of what standards need to be met, and all the parties must know the mandatory standards applying to the products they are importing. And this slide shows the required data elements required on the certificate, which remain the same as it is today. One is the product ID. The second is the citation code. The, um, currently, you have to provide the test, the, cit the citation of the uh, of which testing was done to. Uh, with e-filing, we are standardizing this process by creating codes to make it easier to. Uh, identify which uh, which testing was done to which product safety rule. Your next is the manufacture date, which is when the finished product is manufactured. If it's done over several days or over a batch run, we just ask that you provide the month and year of the first date of manufacturing. Next is the manufacturing location. E-filing will require the name, full address, and contact information of the manufacturing party. Um, this is probably the um, biggest change for the certificate data. Uh, to, in the past, we only really requested the manufacturer location, as in the city and country. Now we're asking for the name and full address. Product test date, uh, when the finished product was tested for compliance. If it was tested over multiple days, you provide the last test date. The testing lab, uh, which includes the name, full address, and contact information and the point of contact for the party maintaining the test report, the, the test results, typically that would be the importer. Over the next few slides, I'll discuss the roles and responsibility of the importer and trade partner. Please note the importer is ultimately responsible for e-filing and the other trade partners may support the importer to whatever extent they choose. These next several slides have a lot of information, which I will be going through rather quickly to make sure we have time for questioning. I just want to note that all this information is available at our on our quick start guide, which is currently available on our webpage. So you could take the opportunity to review um, that information in more detail. We have identified that there are five uh, trade partners. Um, that ultimately could be participating in the e-filing. And of course, most important is the importer. The importer manages an overseas flow of data and the e-filing process to prepare for entry. Therefore, the importer should develop communication channels, update business processes, and the oversee overall integration. The importer should also take the responsibility to review uh, their product's testing requirements. The broker collaborates, communicates, and files certificate data on behalf of the importer because the broker will file the message set data on behalf of the importer. The, the broker is the one who files any import data on behalf of the importer, so they're just uh, going to be filing additional data on their behalf. So the broker would need to update its software and processes in order to do so. So the broker should work with their software developer, but also with importers, develop a means of transfer of the certificate data or certificate identifiers from the importer to the broker. The testing laboratory would gather tests and transmit test inf report information. The testing laboratory can assist importers to what, whatever extent they wish and could develop means to transfer the testing data to the importer. The manufacturer would provide all manufacturing details for applicable products subject to CPSC regulations. The manufacturer then therefore should provide the name of the factory, the address, and the contact information to the importer to include on their certificate. And lastly, is the software developer 
we would develop, execute, and collaborate to integrate technical solutions. Uh, software developers could play two key roles here. One is to update the software for brokers to be able to submit the message that data CBP. Other software developers, which could be internal to your company or external, could also develop an API integration to the product registry to help facilitate the transfer certificate data into the product registry. And now over these next several slides, I will discuss some of the best practices that we have learned from the beta pilot from our 37 participants. And again, all this information is available on our quick start guide. So overall, the five best practices is to define CPSC e-filing requirements early so you could gain comprehensive understanding and set clear, measurable, and specific goals. Uh, establish integrated communication channels so the importer should set clearly defined roles and responsibilities among stakeholders at each step. Develop technical solutions to enable data flow. Gather requirements and implement technical solutions as soon as possible. Importers should consider the level of time, staffing support, and resources required to access your readiness to ensure you have enough time and resources. And lastly, identify the coordinated e-filing model that works best for your business. So the importer should make the business decisions that work best for you and communicate these decisions to your trade partners. We have broken down the best practices into three steps. As you can see here, stage one, learn, define, and communicate. Stage two, integration and development. And stage three, implementation and improvement. In the first stage, the importer should focus on learning about e-filing, which includes reviewing guidance, document material available online, and communicate it internally with their teams, such as the customs and compliance teams internally, internal to their company, and externally with their trade partners, such as brokers, laboratories, and manufacturers. As I mentioned, all the guidance and guidance material and other documents are available at e-filing. Uh, excuse me, at our website, which will be available on the last slide. I do encourage all of you to review the material, in particular for importers to review the product registry guide, which will go into much greater detail of, of the product registry itself, uh, as this presentation does not provide too much detail about that. My team has also developed video snippets of the product registry for you to view. Uh, and also there is other material specifically for your broker, especially the implementation guide for the message set. There's also other materials such as an API specs document, a guidance for CSV upload, guidance for the use of citation codes and testing exclusion codes, et cetera. And for stage one, um, here are the tasks that we believe that uh, you should complete. First is to sign up for our newsletter, uh, but given the size of the attendees here, I believe many of you already have signed up for that, but if you haven't, it's available on our website. Uh, two is to learn more about the e-filing program. Again, please visit our website and review all the material and videos there. And three is to inform your imported train network. So this is where you, the importer should communicate e-filing to the brokers and to their other trade partners and also work internally to develop a business process and also a business process where they take the certificate information and prepare it in a data format. In the second stage, the importer should develop a process flow to communicate certificate data and develop any necessary infrastructure. As you learn about the product registry, you learn there are many ways of providing certificate data into the registry, including via bulk, such as using the CSV template or the API upload. So this would be an opportunity to develop those processes. Again, so uh, for step two, uh, here are the, the checklist. So you wanna develop your business process. So you wanna decide whether you will use a full or reference PJ master set or both, depending on the products you import. Designate a business account administrator for your importer's business account. 
to create an account in the registry. Uh, this business account administrator will be the initial user for your account, but they could immediately invite other business account administrators. Uh, decide whether your business proceed with manual entry or bulk. Identify software developer trade partner for API integration if applicable. Um, and if needed, reach out to CPSC to gain access uh, for software developers to begin API integration. And when you are when you have access to your product registry account, you can invite other trade partners such as brokers and laboratories to assist you. At uh, stage two, you also want to identify data collection requirements, understand roles and responsibilities, understand which the specific data elements that each stakeholder holds and how to um, condense that all together. Uh, you also want to, again, learn about the manual bulk upload process and ensure a comprehensive understanding of the certificate identifiers, which I described earlier in this presentation. And you also want to test product certificate data, such as, such as establishing a connected data flow from the importer to the product registry or to the broker, and then to the broker, establish IT systems to enable data transfer, enter trade party information into the product registry, compile and format certificate data to prepare for entry into the product registry or into ACE, uh, begin API testing if applicable, and begin testing of the manual entry if, or bulk entry if applicable. And lastly, in stage three, the importer should begin e-filing certificate data and testing out the system. So you should begin e-filing, transition to full implementation. You may begin small with a small portfolio of products where you have certificate data readily available, and then you could build up from there, entering more certificate data over time. Uh, and then you want to file the message that data so work with your broker to either communicate the certificate identifiers for the reference message set or all seven data elements for the certificate of compliance for the full message set. And then your broker will file the message that data into ACE and then review any error messages and make corrections if needed. Okay, and this slide provides directions on how to participate. If you have not done so already, already, uh, please sign up for the voluntary state. There is plenty of room. So, the um, first of all, the participant is the importer themselves. So, if you are uh, a different trade partner, you only can participate in the voluntary stage um, via an importer. Uh, you would, and the importer should email efiling support at cpsc.gov with the company name, the initial business account administrator's name, and email. This would be the individual that creates the, the initial business account, um, but from there can invite other users to participate. Uh, also, you should provide the your importer record number, the broker filer codes, and the type of products imported. Uh, invitations will be sent out on a first come first serve basis, as I mentioned at the start of this presentation. This means there'll be a limited number invited each month and over the next several months. And therefore, uh, you may have to wait if you sign up, uh, when you sign up for the wait list. Uh, the purpose of this is that we could provide ad uh, appropriate support to all new uh, participants in e-filing. But in the meantime, we do encourage you to leverage the current resources available on our webpage which I have available on our next slide, cpsc.gov forward slash e-filing. There you would find the document library where you could find the quick start guide, which this presentation was created from. The implementation guide, also called the CATER, which would be useful information for your broker if they haven't seen this already. The product registry guide, FAQs, citation testing exclusion disclaim guidance, CSV upload template, and more. All the information is available um, at cpsc.gov forward slash e-filing, as well as the product registry training videos. These are new video snippets of the product registry. So we do recommend that you review every single video to have an idea of how the product registry works before you uh, gain access to it. 
Um, I know many of you are very eager to begin. Um, however, given the great interest in e-filing and our, our need to provide uh, appropriate support to all new participants, we are limiting the capacity in the first several months. And lastly, if you have any questions, please email efilingsupport at cpsc.gov. Um, that line, that email is the main force of communication uh, between industry and CPSC. Uh, so my team is monitoring that email every day. And so any questions can be sent there uh, and including any technical questions. So as possibly as your software developer, uh, works on an API integration, they can always send questions to that same mailbox and that email will be forwarded to the correct person to answer. So thank you once again for listening to this presentation. At this point, I'll open up to questions where my colleagues, uh, Kat and Craig, will um, read them off to me. We do have quite a few questions. I'm not sure we'll be able to answer them all. Um, we started a document here. Uh, as we put in input data into the product registry, if it is not sent to our broker, is it considered mock data or not recognized by customs? Well, it wouldn't be considered mock data unless you put in purposely put in mock data. So the data won't be used by CPSC until it's attached to an entry. So at that point, once the entry is submitted and CPSC will take those identifiers, find that certificate in the registry and then review that certificate information. Um, I do wanna note that this data is only exclusively used by CPSC. CBP is only facilitating that information to us. Um, so they are not the ones reviewing it, but CPSC is. The next question, the file format between a flat file and the API call, are the data elements the same or does one have more data than the other? Uh, the data elements are the same, I, um, but I believe some of the headings may be a little bit different in both, but I believe they're mostly the same, um, which just means there's no, neither method asks for more information. I do encourage you to review the guidance documents for both. And if you have any specific questions and email the support mailbox. Next question is for larger parent companies with subsidiary companies, is it possible to have one admin for all companies or does each company need to have their own admin? We are a corporate department that does not have representation within each subsidiary company slash brand. Um, that's a very good question. And without knowing more information, I unable to directly answer, but the guidance I could give is um, to ask yourself who is currently on the certificate as a certifier. And that would be the individual, that company would be creating a business account. So, especially for corporations with many brands underneath their umbrella, um, they should consider who's actually certifying the product. If it is the, the company at the top certifying for every product in every brand, then only one business account needs to be created. The product registry is created in such a way where you can have multiple collections. So, you could organize the, the certificate data per brand under one business account. However, if each brand in that company is certifying themselves, then in that case, each of those companies would have to have their own business account. Um, at the moment though, um, uh, different users must create the separate, this business accounts for each of the separate brands. Um, one user cannot be a business account admin for multiple business account that um, currently does not work in our system, um, but if you're running into that issue, then please email efiling support at cpsc.gov because we do have um, a means to work around it. But I just wanted to kind of reiterate this point here because it is a very important point. Um, consider what you are doing now in your company that 
the, that company who is certifying the product now and putting their name on the certificate as the importer remains as the certifier even under e-filing and that company is will be connected to a business account so if you have multiple brands under your company again then you may only need one business account with all your brands under one however if each brand is certifying separately then each of those brands would need a separate business account can we digitize the process of create by creating APIs to upload the required data fields? Yes, there is, we have an API specs document available and uh, many importers with their trade partners have already developed an API integration as part of the beta pilot. And someone else also asked where that document is located. Uh, again, it's available on our website, uh, cpsc.gov forward slash e-filing. All information about e-filing is found there. So please bookmark it. If we are importing components that will be incorporated in a product that require a safety rule test report, does it need to be processed through the PGA system? That's a very good question. Uh, and e-filing only applies to finished product. The certificate requirement only applies to finished product. So component parts, if they're brought in for further manufacturing in the US uh, are not subject to e-filing. But I do wanna know, um, a, there could be possible scenarios where CPSC would consider uh, a component part, especially if it's like an accessory um, to be considered a finished product. Uh, one example I could give you is um, especially with toys. So if you, if you import a product, like an accessory, let's give an example of like doll clothing for a doll, um, because those accessories are sold separately and directly to consumer, and subject to the ASTM toy standard, those would be subject to e-filing because they are considered finished products in this case. Um, how, and so this, typically what I'm telling you right now will really only apply to toys because you could have the main toy and then accessories to that toy sold separately, as you can see at any box retailer. And those accessories will still be subject to uh, many CPSC requirements for toys. For other products, this is typically not the case. Most other uh, products outside of toys are subject to separate requirements, which apply to finished products. So for example, if you bring in um, component parts to manufacture, let's say a bicycle in the US, that bicycle as a finished product is subject to CPSC requirements and still requires testing, even, even if it's manufactured domestically. Uh, the component parts imported are not subject to e-filing. You do not have to file a certificate. However, um, you can, if those component parts are tested, are tested separately, you could use those separate component part tests to compile a finished product certificate. But those component part certificates do, are not filed. So again, you have to um, consider what is the finished product. There was a slide earlier in this presentation um, and there's more information on our quick start guide that does address this, but um, just consider um, whether this product is finished or a component part uh, and only finished products are subject to e-filing. Is there a maximum number of certificates that can be referenced per entry summary line or is there no limit? I'm going to say no limit because the tech, there is a technical limit of how much data points that CBP can handle. Um, but they have assured me that num that limit is very high, that I do not believe that any of you, um, maybe in a rare instance, would an importer actually hit that limit. Um, so for all intents and purposes, the answer is no. So every time testing is renewed, a new version will be uh, required, correct? Correct. Uh, I think that's the best rule of thumb here if you do new testing for the product, such as annual retesting for a children's product, or there's a change in your manufacturing process that requires you to do new testing, then create a new certificate. For the version ID, what if we intend to make more than one batch, but then only have one? Can I use a version one name for every certificate, even if there is not a version two? Yes. Um, the what you need to remember is that the product ID and version ID must be unique. So if you have, if you are 
let's say, for example, creating products for new holiday season and you don't know which products are going to um, be popular and need to be remanufactured. Uh, and for all those products, you use version one and only for a sample, do you continue uh, with a new batch and then you create a version two? That is perfectly fine. Um, that versioning number is really up to you, however you want to create it for however you internally could keep track of your certificates. We're not really going to dictate um, how you use that version number as long as the product ID and version number is unique. Uh, do products need to be certified if imported under a TIB entry type 23? Um, I believe that is uh, temporary in bond and yes. note that it's not subject to e-filing. What is the difference between a product testing exemption and a disclaim? Uh, yeah, this is a very important to know, and I do encourage you to review the full guidance available. Um, so I'm going to start with a disclaim. A disclaim is where no certificate is required at all. So if you have a product that's outside of CPSC's jurisdiction, or if it's a product that is within our jurisdiction, but not regulated by CPSC, or there's a enforcement discretion by the commission, then you, you could provide a disclaim, which, a, which is optional. Um, one of the biggest commission enforcement discretions, excuse me, is adult wearing apparel, where the commission has stated, then no certificates required. So that's a big example where you would disclaim. Uh, testing exclusions is different, um, but I do understand where there could be confusion. So testing exclusion is where uh, a certificate is already required. And for any certain tests or citations that are on the certificate, the laboratory is using a testing exclusion um, as part of that testing. So for example, uh, for lead testing for toys, there is a testing exclusion for inaccessible parts. So, in that scenario, the laboratory will still do their testing for lead um, and list that specific citation. I believe that's 13, 16 CFR 1303. But at the same time, they would list the testing exclusion, uh, which would inform CPSC that they did their due diligence, did the testing for lead, but have been using this exclusion um, for lead in inaccessible parts. And so I do encourage you to review the citation codes available um, on our website because there are two lists. One is all the citation codes that testing can be conducted to, and a second is testing exclusion codes. And those exclusion codes should be used in conjunction with the citation code. So um, you would never have a scenario where you just have a certificate filled with testing exclusions. You still have to provide um, the citation codes to which testing was done and which lab has done the testing um, because it's a lab who does make the determination as to uh, which exclusions are being used uh, as part of the testing. Regarding manufacturer location, could an agent trading company or vendor name and address be provided or must the actual factory be disclosed? We're looking for the actual physical location of the factory. Should required labeling also be listed under the citation codes, for example, UL 4200 labeling requirements? Um, I believe, I don't know if I could give a exact answer to that requirement, but Labeling, I don't believe is uh, covered, but it's not a technically a testing requirement. Labeling does not need to be certified. Um, so you don't have to list that on, on your certificate, um, which is the same guidance as today. But if you have a specific question um, related to that, you could email us at our support mailbox. If we only ship direct to consumer, will we still be liable for e-filing? Or does yes. this depend on order value? No, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's no de minimis exemption. That is only a tariff exemption by custom. Um, and this applies actually across the board to any other agency that is a public health and safety agency that has its own data requirements. That data must be provided to CPSC or any of the other agencies. Just because no tariff is paid on it, 
does not mean that you do not have to provide any data that is required. So if you are um, provide, importing direct to consumer, you should e-file for each of, of those products. That's why the product registry should be particularly useful here because uh, assuming that you're importing many of the same products direct to consumer. Um, I have a remote control which is regulated because it contains a coin cell battery. This remote is manufactured by manufacturer number one. However, it is sent to the end product manufacturer overseas and is imported as part of an end product. In this case, who is identified as the manufacturer, the remote manufacturer or the end product manufacturer? Um, so uh, this applies kind of to any case. Uh, when we're looking for manufacturer, we're looking at the final point of assembly. So in this scenario, you provide the final point. However, you could use, uh, if there are separate testing done on that remote prior to being sent to the final manufacturer for the assembly into the greater product, you could use um, any of the testing done on that remote as part of your final product certificate. If an assortment of products is imported under a single SKU, UPC, or G10, and there are multiple certificates to cover the individual products within that assortment, is there a way to file multiple references for one parent SKU, or would that need to be filed as separate entries for each component? For example, one box that includes a yellow toy and a blue toy were tested separately, but are packed into a single carton. Uh so certificates should be unique. There should only be one product per certificate. So in that case, a blue toy and yellow toy each would have a separate certificate, and therefore would have to have uh, be filed in a separate message set. Even though they may be captured by the same SKU, you would have to provide a product ID that um, uniquely identifies the product: one for the blue toy, one for um, the yellow toy. Um, I, and so I do want to know about the uniqueness one product per one per certificate when it comes to apparel, though, where apparel usually is tested um, together as in one apparel item in multiple cut styles and sizes, et cetera. That would be still considered as one product per CPSC, but in every other case, um, CPSC would consider any uh, material change in a product to be considered separate and unique products. And the example of a yellow toy and blue toy, um, there's a difference in the paint, of course, or the material that, um, so that is technically a material change and therefore uh, should have its own certificate. There was a question about when is the anticipated day when the final rule would be issued? So the rule will be sent to the commission later um, this year, and they make the ultimate decision as to the publication date and enforcement date. As staff, um, as we prepare the proposed rule to send commission, we are providing a recommendation as to um, the rollout period um, to give industry enough time to prepare for the new rule. Um, and that recommendation will be based off of feedback we received during the beta pilot from importers and from broker brokers, and they're asked to quantify how long it took them to prepare for e-filing. Um, again, this is a um, commission decision and they're signaling that the expect, ex expectation that sometime in 2025 is when the rule will be published and then um, effective at some later point. Can one individual manage the entirety of the importer's responsibilities in this process of e-filing? Uh, dependent on how your company is ran um, and the size of the company, I would say yes. Um, I do encourage, though, to work within your company and with your trade partners at your brokers, have a clear understanding of roles and responsibilities, and to make sure there is coverage when um, that individual is not in the office. What would be the benefit of IT integration if there is an option bulk submit with a CSV file? Uh, the API integration is just another option we're providing. Um, some importers specifically ask for it because of the amount of data they handle for their product. 
However, the CSV upload bulk upload has shown to be a very useful tool for many importers that um, that CSV template could, I believe at the moment, uh, hold up to several hundred, upload several hundred certificates at once. Um, so we're just giving options for importers here. Do we have to work with a broker or can we uh, e-file directly within the company? So you have to work with a broker when it comes to submitting the message set because the broker does that on your behalf. Um, whenever they submit any any information to customs, it's the same part of the same process. Um, the only time when the importer would do it as a self filer is when they have an in house broker and they, as name suggests, they self file. But in most cases, um, the broker files on the importer's behalf. However, when it comes to product registry, you could the importer could just handle that themselves if they choose to. They don't need the broker's involvement there. What the broker just really needs at the end is a certifier certificate identifiers to include in the reference message set. When disclaiming, it appears that the intended use code is mandatory. Is it really needed on a disclaim transaction? None of the other PGAs require this for disclaims. Yeah, so we actually updated our Kutera guidance there and intended use codes are not required. Um, disclaims remain optional, but we do encourage you um, first to disclaim um, if you're able to for a product because, and to provide intended use code. The more information you provide to CPSC, the better informed our investigators are that this plot product clearly is not subject to a certificate requirement. Um, so they'll be better informed in their targeting. Once in the voluntary stage, do we need to provide documentation for all shipments or add registry data over time as we go? What if the customs broker is not ready to send in the reference set? So the whole point of the voluntary stage is to prepare for full implementation so you could start small and build up from there. My recommendation is to start where you have um, the certificate data readily available and then continue um, to increase the number of certificates you file for from there. And of course, once there is an enforcement date um, announced or implementation date announced, excuse me, at that point, you would have to file for all, certi all products that require certification. Is it accurate that only importers and brokers should be sending the PGA message sets to the API? Um, so the API is separate. The API is exclusive to the product registry. I think you may be confusing API with the EBI, which is the automated broker interface that CBP uses. So it's typically only the broker who deals with that. The importer just sends the information to the broker and the broker submits the data to CBP. So if you have questions related to that process, you should really speak to your broker. Can you speak to how CPSC data does not impact entry admissibility decisions? Is there a return PGA may proceed message or something that will allow the entry to clear, but then CPSC will be looking into the data submitted in the background to determine if they need to reach out to the IOR for more information? Yeah, and I think this would be the last question for this webinar. So. The data certificate data will be used for risk assessment. So compliance certificate data will help lower your risk score. Um, and if there's any red flags in the data that may increase your risk score, if there's missing data that may increase your risk score as well. Uh, that data, the intent is not to use it for admissibility. So even if there are errors, um, the only risk you assume is a higher risk score of your shipment, so a higher chance your shipment may be held, uh, maybe um, put on hold for an exam, but that is a manual process done by an investigator. The investigator ultimately makes a decision um, based on the risk scores in our system. If there is an error, then you, um, your broker would receive an error message and you're able to correct that. Um, that is advisable, so your risk score could be lowered. Uh, and then the under review clock remains as it is today. Uh, and so after the under review clock, 
does run out, you still receive a may proceed message, um, even if there's an error in your e-filing data. And so on that note, I do want to thank every each and every single one of you for joining us today. We did have a, a rather huge crowd today. Um, thank you for listening. This presentation will be available on our website relatively soon. And again, please visit cpsc.gov forward slash e-filing for more information or email us at e-filing support at cpsc.gov if you have any further questions or if you would like to sign up for the voluntary stage. Um, thank you and have a good rest of your day.